Here's an amazing question. Can paralyzed kids get back on their feet and walk? Well, see for yourself right now on Keeping Kids Healthy. I'm Dr. Winnie King in the lobby of the Children's Hospital in Montefiore in New York, and we have an extraordinary story for you today. Imagine being a young man and hearing the words, you're paralyzed, you'll probably never walk again. What if you're a parent and the doctor says that about your child? Where do you go for help? How can you possibly keep hope alive? Well, you can, because there's a revolution going on in the field of spinal cord rehabilitation. We have the stories of a young man named Matt and a little girl named Jessica who just don't know the word quit. Jim Bunn begins with Matt's story. He was on top of the world. College student Matt Weifels, a professional snowboarder, was on national television. He'd already won one event, finished second in another, and was on his way to winning a third. It was the best day of his life. Then, suddenly, it was the worst. Literally before I even left the jump, I knew I, knew I was going to screw up. I wasn't very concerned because I'd taken big falls before. I tried to spot the ground. After I'd hit, I was sliding head first downhill. I wasn't stopping. I couldn't tell why. I, I don't know if I tried to sit up or just couldn't sit up, but then I, you know, I asked them to take my snowboard off, and they said it's already off. I asked them to take my boots off. They said your boots are already off too. And that's when I just put my head back into that actual instant thought because I knew what had happened at that point. And yes. Matt was paralyzed from the waist down. He was told he would spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. He'd never walk, never even stand again. The first thought I had when I got hurt was that, uh, uh, like a mental image of the, uh, like the lions attacking the wounded wildebeest. <laughs> and uh, how those get eaten first and stuff, you know, and it's all right because they're injured and they need to get eaten. But how our society is not even that kind. I thought that was like the first thought I had was that how horrible our society is because now I'm going to live. It would have been devastating for anyone. But to fully appreciate what Matt lost, you need to understand what snowboarding meant to him. It begins with his first memory of snow. I remember tunneling around my yard and, and truly tunneling. So like we could go from the entire one edge of the yard to the other without being seen and we were under the snow the whole time and, and building snow forts in the snow banks. Then he discovered he could slide on it and his life changed forever. I don't know, it was exhilarating. You could, you could go faster and this whole concept of snow being soft and fluffy, like it's like your friends. So you can go as fast as you want and not get hurt. Every morning I'd wake up really, really early and I just, I loved getting all my stuff together. It's kind of like, the, like a routine or just a preparation. It's almost like a prayer, you could say. It's so ritualized. I worship snowboarding. I specifically wouldn't allow myself to get in any relationships of any depth because if you fell for someone, you might actually skip a day on the mountain. You'd lose your edge or something like that. I wouldn't allow it, you know. Life was about experiences and riding every day and literally loving my life at age 18. I think I was spoiled. I remember looking up and being like, God, if you're out there, I don't need anything more. I love just staring at the mountains. In, uh, in Breckenridge, you've got a, a western ridge or whatever, so the sun goes down behind the mountains, but then you've got this beautiful blue sky with the silhouette of the mountains, and every night it was just so cool because I'd look at that and know that the next day would come and I'd be able to ride those mountains. It was my one life, love, and dream, and commitment. And so when he was told that his one true love was going to be replaced by a wheelchair, Matt said, no, one way or the other, that will not happen. I was giving myself two options. I was either going to work hard and work my way back onto my feet and into walking, standing life, or I was going to end my life. Well, the wonderful news is that Matt did not make that drastic step, and he's here with us today, and we are so glad that you are. But, um, you know, tell us, why did you feel that way? Why did you get to that point where you were really thinking about ending it all? Well, at that point, uh, I didn't have a hope for the future, 
and really my self-image and who I was was just was over. So in my essence, you know, I was over. That's terrible. Well, David Salzberg is a psychologist from the Rusk Institute who specializes in treating young people with traumatic injury. And neurologist John McDonald heads the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And um, David, let's talk about this this reaction that that Matt had. Is that typical? Although there's no one typical reaction, it's certainly normal for anyone to have such an intense reaction of either sadness, anger, hopelessness, and it's really the responsibility of the treatment team, the medical staff, to support both the, ch the child or young adult and their family to give them the most sense of hope as possible. And John, the research really supports that, doesn't it? The concept of uh, the positive messages being uh, helpful for people in a situation like this? Oh yeah, it's really critical. I mean, it's essential to provide hope. There are things that, that can be done today. There's amazing research that will impact individuals tomorrow, but there's things that could be done today for everyone living with a spinal cord injury. And Matt, your doctors actually weren't very encouraging, were they? No. No? Uh, they didn't really think that I had a, you know, a chance to walk again and uh, mention some of the programs that they could get me in contact with weren't really, you know, the programs to get me back on my feet, just kind of uh, adapt. Right, just, well, this is that. it, so let's just settle in and make the best yep. of a bad situation. Yep. So what gave you the strength to go on? How did you move beyond that? Well, first I, you know, got a new relationship with God, and that was just awesome, and I uh, was able to relocate to Utah and join in the Sit Tall, Stand Tall program, yeah. which is phenomenal. My brother moved out from California and helped me transplant, and. Get, get settled in. Yeah. Another big factor from that was the encouragement from his family and his friends who began trooping down to his hospital room the moment he was injured. It was like a constant, constant flow. There'd be like 30 people in his room, outside his room, waiting to say hi. Just everybody rallied together. Then Matt's friends organized the perfect fundraiser. An amateur snowboarding competition in his hometown of Breckenridge. And the first event was crazy because Matt was in, in his hospital bed. We had him on the cell phone talking to him as the whole whole crowd in the park was cheering for him. And so he could he could hear us all cheering for him and it brought him to tears and it was just like a crazy rally just for Matt. The support from Matt's friends and a promising rehab program in Utah called Sit Tall, Stand Tall helped give Matt the strength to go on. And there's all these people that just keep bugging the crap out of you and believing in you. And who, who knows what they're up to, but they're doing things like fundraisers. And now the guilt starts to arise. Now they've already raised all this money and I'm spending it on myself. So now I'm at the program and I'm realizing that the program's actually true and I am gonna walk someday if I just stick with it. And the crowding out the concept of suicide is that now you're actually finally able to accept the fact that how selfish of an act suicide would have been. And so Matt rededicated himself to life. Amy Sabrine, who still remembers a painful trip to Matt's hospital room, followed his journey. When I was going down to the hospital, um, I figured um, Matt could really use all the luck in the world, so I brought him my two favorite good luck charms, this little outward bound book that has a whole bunch of quotes in it, and uh, my disco ball necklace, and I gave him to Matt and told him that, you know, they've always brought me good luck and they've always helped me through really hard times and that hopefully they'd help him and he didn't want to take him. He said, no, no, I can't take your favorite good luck charms. And I said, I said, give them back to me when you can walk. What happened next could be called a miracle. Last year he showed up at Breckenridge without his wheelchair using his canes and he was walking and he gave the, the gift back to me. So that was a pretty cool thing. So you were walking, and you were able to fulfill that promise that you gave to Amy. Okay, Matt, show us how you do it. Okay. Click in my leg braces. Okay. And now, what are you doing? How are you moving? Well, we um, teach a shift lift step concept. That sits all, sit tall, stand tall, and then I want you to level. You step through your canes and go heel toe. You know, so you've just, completely given up your wheelchair? Yes, I have. Wow. Amazing. 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 Now, you use braces, mm -hmm. right? Show us your braces. Yeah. It's a K-A-F-O. That's what it's called. And it just goes down there. Movable ankle as well. Uh -huh. So, yeah, just clicks in or it's bent. So. And how did you learn to do this? 
Well, I moved to Utah, which is where I was directed as pretty much, you know, the place to go if you wanted to walk again. So the Sit Tall, Stand Tall program. And you did Provo, it. Provo, Utah, yeah. Well, to understand how Matt accomplished what he did, we took a trip to Utah to watch his therapy in progress. You would never guess by looking at it, but inside this unassuming house in Provo, Utah... Good boy, lock it up and turn around. Matt found the miracle he was looking for. Mr. Sands! Out on that treadmill till I tell you to get off of it. Get on that treadmill now. For over 20 years, Leighton Weber has run the Sit Tall, Stand Tall program, where Matt and his friend, Tucker Fife, are learning to walk. Now, when Matt Weifels came to the Sit Tall, Stand Tall program, Matt Weifels did this. Fell over. I had to sit him back up. I says, okay, Matt, I put my hand like this. Go to my hand. Take it back as hard as you can. Go to my hand. Take it back as hard as you can. And this took a number of months to get the stabilizers to start to function. Just to sit up? Just to, just to sit in a vertical L. To build strength, Leighton adds a weight-bearing exercise. Then comes sideways movement. When Matt came here, because he couldn't move at all, I basically turned him. And I'd say to him, you understand what I'm doing? No, can't feel anything. Why am I doing this, okay? Here it is like this, turning. All of a sudden, I'm taking my hands off. He's turning. Can you feel that? No, you're doing it on your own. Next, learning to, to flex the hips, hips to then the crawl. Remember, each one of these people have a Harrington rod or some kind of fusion in their back, which makes them very stiff. When he would get in this position, his hips wouldn't drop any lower than that. It was the same thing with Matt. Now. Once he starts to crawl, once the crawling element is in place, got to be able to get on these canes in space. This is, what, this is what it takes right here. This is the whole key to it. Now, here we go. I'll stand here. I stood here with Matt like this. I'd stay stationary this cane and hold it. And then he would get his hips to pop up. Then I'd let it go. We start with that. Now look at his position. This is the most important part of this whole thing. Vertical position through his back, hips dropped and through, and now he can function on his knees. Now, this man gets his braces in a couple weeks. He'll walk the first day he has his braces because he's achieved this, this step right here. Now pull it off. Matt began to walk less than a year after his accident, but his conditioning continues. It's tough. Even learning to snap a leg brace closed takes superhuman effort. The whole key is, it, is to straighten his leg, snap his brace on his own. Press your heel. That's what I want. Excellent. Good. Press it. Press it. Press it. You got it. Come on. You bailed on that one now. Press, 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 press. Press. Press it. Come on. Press it. Press it. You're there. Press it. Lock it up. Lock it up. Lock it up. Lock it, man. It's locked. That much. Okay. Good job. Then, finally, the treadmill. This is a manual treadmill. When he started this, he couldn't do this. So I would stand behind him, and he would try to keep up with me. So I would be back here. He would get behind like this, where he would step on my foot, I'd have to stop. Then we went to 30 seconds. Then we went to 45. Then we went to a minute. And then all of a sudden, keep going. I stepped off, and he didn't even know I was off of it. And he was doing it. I'm going like, that's pretty good for somebody who can't walk. Matt has now realized his miracle. Life without a wheelchair. All right, we'll see you tomorrow, Layden. When you enter your life standing and walking again you're almost born again in a sense now you're relearning stuff the first time you brush your teeth standing up again first time you shave um, you know leaning against the counter so you've got both your arms free so you can pour a glass of milk and and hug your relatives and girlfriend when you see them you know kissing standing up walking to a movie and holding the door all these things are are just incalculable you can't you can't truly put it into words how that changes your life i am exhausted 
just <laughs> watching that. Matt, how did you put out such an effort like that? Just, you know, really um, working hard every day has kind of become my job now. And, you know, I've just decided to commit to that. And we do that Monday through Friday. And I've got a real connection with Leighton. And he's, yeah. you know, he's able to motivate me yeah. quite well. And, yeah, and I would say just so. just kind of goes back and forth. We really feed off um, all the other guys in the gym, too. And yeah. when they do something they've never done before, it just excites us and it just kind of goes around and you know really he really good. sounds like such a taskmaster but what's your relationship with him well it's, it's gone much deeper than that uh, for me it's Leighton and I have a, a connection on many levels to our, you know our sporting you know background and hard work ethic um, it's really become a confidant for me I can yes. call him and, and have had a, an excellent bond with him yeah yeah no and it shows it really does show Susan Howley is the Director of Research for the Christopher Reeve Paralysis Foundation. And um, help us to understand what we're seeing here, Susan. Um, what's going on? Uh, what are the capabilities that we have in our body that Matt is tapping into? The capabilities are far greater than we used to think. The brain and the spinal cord actually have the capacity to respond and change after injury or disease. It's called plasticity. And all of this fierce exercise, physical therapy, that Matt has engaged in has actually been providing the brain and the cord and a special little brain in the spinal cord called a pattern generator. His exercise has been feeding sensory information into the pattern generator and retraining the spinal cord how to step and walk. Well, it just seems so strange, I think, to the average person hearing you talk about doing that when there's a, a disruption in the connection between the brain and the spinal cord. How can that work? So a spinal cord injury actually interrupts the flow of communication between the brain and the spinal cord. The beauty of the central pattern generator is that this little brain that's located in everyone's spinal cord has the capacity to function without input from the brain up here and the physical therapy is actually giving it the information that it needs in order to remember how to step and walk. Is that a new concept? I mean, I didn't hear that in med school. The original basic science was done 30 years ago, and it was Dr. Sten Grillner who actually uh, discovered the presence of this central pattern generator. Oh, amazing. Well, John, what's happening with, when you're involved in fitness training? inside the, the spinal cord. I mean, are you actually regenerating cells? What's going on? Yeah, we're starting to understand now the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for this recovery. And activity is one of those things that stimulates these molecules to do what they're supposed to do for plasticity and regeneration. So new cells born, finding the right place, deciding what to become, making new connections insulating or allowing those connections to communicate properly. And this all is the, just the result of fitness training, makes all of this happen. Yeah, the idea is to let's simultaneously accomplish two goals. Let's maximize the spontaneous ability of someone to regenerate and recover function, and then optimize the physical being of the body. Now what about other techniques like electrical stimulation? Yeah, so electrical stimulation can be used under the special circumstance when people can't move possible to stimulate the muscle across the skin so that now that muscle could be exercised and it could be rapidly built its strength. If you don't have strength, you can't learn to use that muscle. Right. Well, these techniques can be used on the tiniest children as well. Jessica Hill's story began on the day of her birth. Meet the little girl and the determined mother who wouldn't take no for an answer. Jessica was born nine and a half weeks premature and she had a stroke to her spinal cord. And they said, we don't expect her to crawl or walk. They basically told me that I was taking home a vegetable. They had no idea what she would ever be capable of in her entire life. And my belief was, it doesn't matter. She's here with me. If she can't walk, I will take her, carry her wherever she needs to go. We will find a way to get there. We kept searching for doctors. We, we kept looking for answers. What do we do next? Where do we go? And I just felt that if somebody would take me seriously and somebody would look at her and see the spark that she has, they would know all we need is guidance, and we can do whatever it takes. Sometimes you do catching. Uh huh. A little bit faster. All the way. I remember one evening watching the news, Dr. John McDonald on there, and was talking about his pioneering research on spinal cord injuries. And, and I thought, this is the guy I need to talk to. Jess was, um, she was about two and a half years old, and he was telling us that the simple thing she needed to do was learn to walk on a walking pattern 
Just something, some way she'd be, over to be able to do it over and over again. It is almost like Granny. I don't know it. See? It's like Johnny. Really? It was common sense. I mean, we got to train her what to do, you know, it, and, and it made so much sense. When he told me about that, um, I could understand it. Get out of here. Get out of here. She's lucky to have me, and I'm lucky to have her. I, I think we are just a team that's, that's unstoppable. I think if the parent can focus on the positive and the upbeat and show the kid all the good, true stuff and try to shelter them from the bad stuff. I mean, they're going to have to hear about it, but don't show your emotions on the bad stuff as being overwhelming in front of the children. And let them see all the good, the positive. They'll go on their own from there on out. Can I show you my new trick? I think I see a little bit of you, Matt, in uh, Jessica and her mom. It sounds kind of familiar. You know, there's so much to learn from Jessica's story about recovery from all kinds of childhood trauma that we'll be doing a whole Keeping Kids Healthy program about it. And you'll learn how to get these kids back on their feet emotionally and physically. But, uh, John, what, what do we need to learn from the story that we just saw? The, the importance of pro providing access to continuous treatments is really essential. And then the will and desire and commitment of the parents to go beyond the no, go beyond and seek it, it is critical. Yeah, mom's attitude was huge in this, wasn't it? Yeah, her amazing attitude. You know, the, the attitude that they share is the attitude of an athlete, of looking for long-term uh, benefits, this commitment to excellence and accomplishment. Yeah. David, what can other families learn from watching this? This is a perfect example of just trusting your instincts uh, as a parent. You know your children better than any doctor ever will. And if that means listening to some information from one doctor but seeking out another, then do it. And if you hear something that doesn't sound right, trust your instinct and find the people who, the rehab facility, the team that's going to help your child achieve their hopes and dreams. So second opinion is okay? Absolutely. Well, Susan, for doctors and families, where's the line between giving uh, realistic expectations and false hope? I think maybe Christopher Reeve said it best of all, um, that there is no such thing as false hope because hope is so incredibly empowering. It's hard to predict exactly how far we're going to be able to go, but we've done things in the last 20 years that no one believed possible. So I agree with Chris. I don't think there is anything like false hope we have to be realistic and we have to understand where we are but we should never lose hope well you know matt uh, one example of the unbelievable determination of spirit you have is that a year after your accident you actually climbed back on the snowboard and went down the bunny hill in colorado oh my gosh what did that feel like oh it was just awesome to uh, be back on the board again gliding feeling the wind you yeah know, the, putting on my boots and stuff that day was just phenomenal can you remember those moments when you were up there like that? You're looking yeah. really cool. I can, yeah. My buddy Pearson was helping me. That's amazing. Well, now, who is this beautiful lady who's sitting next to you? This is my new bride, Kim. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about Kim. Well, she's just been an amazing part of uh, all this. She makes it possible. I think of her as my piece of heaven. And and you guys just man. recently got married? Yes, one month ago. A month ago? Yeah. Well, congratulations. I just, I feel like I want to cry. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful moment. Well, Matt, you get the final word today. Uh, tell us, there's some things you want to tell people about what you've been through. Okay, well, the thing that I could say would just be that it's not over until you say it's over for the families and for the children hurt and just encourage them to find a facility that they're just around other people doing it and they will have success themselves and just never give up. And Matt, I also want our viewers to hear what you told our producer, Jim Bunn, about how you've changed since your snowboarding days. When I was 16 years old, I rode, it, rode down Jupiter Bowl and had fresh powder the whole way down. At the bottom, I looked up and I didn't know if God existed or not, but I said, if, if you do, you can turn me into a bird because I'm done. That's like all I ever needed was, was that single run down the powder. And now it's, okay, no, that's not all you ever needed. You know, now it's sweet. Life's awesome. You can still go to Japan and, and Italy and, and do all these cool things and enjoy them, and I'm going to have a wife to enjoy them with, and, and maybe I'll even have some kids, which would just be an even more phenomenal gift, you know, to hold, like, a little, little kid in my arms. And... What would you say if you were holding that baby right now and saying to him or her, here's what I want you to know? Mm -hmm. I'd say something like, uh, 
life is, is so, so much of a gift for us. Every experience, every blue sky you see, enjoy it completely in the full, just at, at that each moment, you know, enjoy that moment so much, as well as understanding that it's so fragile. Life is so amazing and wonderful, you have to just enjoy it. And, and, and I, I actually got a tattoo two weeks before I got hurt. It's a Chinese symbol that means never forget the pleasure of the journey. And I think that that's what I'd want to tell my kids. You know, there's no regrets. If something went wrong, you learn from it. It's equally as important as your, your successes. That's such a wonderful attitude. You know, it's something that we can all learn so much from. And to learn more about spinal cord rehabilitation, visit the Christopher Reeve Foundation at ChristopherReeve.org and click on the link to Paralysis Resource Center. Or you can call them at 800-539-7309. Or go to Kennedy Krieger International Center for Spinal Cord Injury. And that's at SpinalCordRecovery.org. Or you can call them at 888 888- Five five four two zero eight zero, and to check out Matt's rehab program in Utah, go to sittallstandtall.com. Well, that's not the end of this story. Join all of us, including Jessica, on the next Keeping Kids Healthy, and see why there's a new hope for all kids with paralysis. Thank you guys, every one of you, for being on the show today and sharing your experiences. Thank you, Matt. Congratulations to you and Kim, and thanks to all of our guests for this incredible lesson in the power of the human spirit. See you next time on Keeping Kids Healthy. For more on today's topics, visit KeepingKidsHealthy.org.